So what is it that makes quadratic, cubic, and quartic polynomials so special? These are the degrees of polynomials that have formulas that tell us how to find their roots merely by doing some simple computations with their coefficients. So simple, in fact, that the quadratic formula is memorized by pretty much every Algebra 2 student in the world. The fact that cubic and quartic formulas exist is a little bit less well known, but they do. On the other hand, it's our job to figure out why there is no such thing as a quintic formula. In other words, the general fifth degree polynomial cannot be solved, in other words, we can't find its roots, merely by some simple combination of taking its coefficients and putting them into a machine and cranking it out. We want to understand why that is. Using now the most powerful tool that we have at our disposal, the Galois correspondence. And if you haven't looked at the Galois correspondence yet, do it. Because we're going to use it in this series of videos to really understand what's going on. Remember, the Galois correspondence gives us a one-to-one -one relationship between fields, and in particular, we're going to care about the splitting field of a polynomial, and groups specifically the groups of automorphisms of those extended fields. And according to the Galois correspondence, the picture that we see on one side and the picture that we see on the other side are exactly the same. And so if we want to understand something about fields, for example, something about how to solve polynomial equations to find their roots, the Galois correspondence tells us that it's enough to know something about groups instead. And it turns out that the tools of abstract algebra give us a lot of ways to understand the structure of a group. So what we want to do in this next couple of videos is figure out what is it about polynomials of degree 2, 3, and 4 that make it possible for them to have a simple formula to discover their roots. And we're going to do that by answering the question, if we can find the roots of a polynomial in a simple fashion, in other words, if the splitting field is of a certain form, how will we recognize that by the structure of its automorphism group. And the Galois correspondence tells us that those two stories have to be the same. So if you haven't watched the video on our Galois correspondence yet, if you're on a PC, click right here and it'll take you there. Um, if you have, then let's get going. So we want to understand, when is it that a polynomial has a formula in radicals to solve it? We're going to call those polynomials solvable by radicals. And this property is going to be the calling card of the quadratic formula. And it also exists for cubic and quartic. So in this video, we're going to look at what exactly it is that makes quadratic and cubic formulas possible in terms of the structure of their splitting field. In other words, how do we build a tower to generate a splitting field for a quadratic or a cubic? And what does it have to do with the quadratic formula and the cubic formula? So we're going to have a recipe. Uh, when we have a formula, we have a recipe for how to calculate the roots of that polynomial just using its coefficients. To solve a polynomial in radicals means to discover its roots through a finite series of simple algebraic steps that include addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. But then the one step that's most interesting to us for solving polynomial equations is taking simple nth roots. So a polynomial is solvable in radicals if we can find its roots through a finite sequence of these operations starting from its coefficients. The quadratic formula is something that we all know by now. And we can state it in a slightly more sophisticated fashion by saying that if this polynomial p, t squared plus bt plus c, is irreducible over the rationals, then its splitting field is exactly the simple extension of the rationals by the square root of b squared minus 4c. Here our polynomial is monic, so we don't need 4ac, we just need 4c. And not only that, we have the quadratic formula that tells us what exactly its roots are in that extended field, 1 half times the quantity negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4c. So the story here is that we have this quadratic formula to discover the roots. We have that formula that you remember precisely because we have a field that has a certain structure. So the field that we require in order to have this quadratic formula is exactly q adjoined with the square root of b squared minus 4c. And so the picture for building the splitting field of a quadratic polynomial is that we start with q, and if we don't have the roots of that quadratic in q, in other words, if the roots aren't rational, then we have to make an extension in order to get those roots. And the extension we make is exactly that extension that takes the rational number b squared minus 4c and constructs 
its square root. If we call that square root alpha, then alpha is characterized by the property that alpha squared is equal to b squared minus 4c, which is back in our base field. So the nature of this extension is that we're making a simple extension by an element whose power, namely whose second power, is back in the base field. Remember that that doesn't always happen in a simple extension, but it does in this case. So that explains for us why a quadratic formula exists. It exists because all the solutions of a quadratic may be found in this simple extension, a simple extension by an element whose square belongs back in the base field, namely the square root of b squared minus 4c. So that's the story in degree two. A single square root is all we need to split any quadratic polynomial. There is also a formula that tells us how to split a cubic. So here's a clipping from the Wikipedia article for it. There is a cubic formula. It's substantially more complicated than the quadratic, but it works. So let's take a look at it and see what exactly it is that we need in a splitting field for a general cubic. So here's the solution. x sub k is equal to this combination of, uh, of quantities. So the splitting field of this cubic polynomial needs the following additional elements that may not be rational. They might be, but they might not be. First of all, we might need the cubed root of unity, zeta 3, which is a non-real solution to t cubed minus 1 equals 0. So we might need that. We might also need this thing, which is under the square root of the quantity that's called c uh, in the Wikipedia article. That is negative 27 times a squared times delta, where delta is really the squared discriminant of this cubic polynomial. So we're going to need this. On the other hand, if we have zeta 3, then we might already have the square root of negative 27, because we would have 3 times the square root of negative 3 by virtue of having the third root of unity. So really, it's just the square root of the discriminant, the square root of delta, uh, which is actually equal to the discriminant itself in the notation Wikipedia is using, that we're going to definitely need in some fashion in our extended field that splits the cubic. And the last thing we need is potentially a cube root, a cube root of this quantity delta 1 plus the square root of delta all over 2. So we might need each of these three elements in our splitting field. Well, we do need each of these three elements in our splitting field. Uh, so in general, we might have to extend one by one to get each of them. So we may have to build a bigger tower for a cubic than we do for a quadratic. But let's take a look at the tower itself that we would have to build starting from the rationals. Now in the rationals, we have the squared discriminant which we can determine via the coefficients because it's a fully symmetric polynomial in the roots. We also have these sort of sub-discriminants, delta 0 and delta 1, that are from the Wikipedia article. So all of those things begin their lives in the rational field. And for our first step, let's adjoin the third root of unity, which is definitely not a rational number. Now that third root of unity that we adjoined has the property that if I raise it to the third power, I get 1, and 1 is back in my base field. Our next step might be to extend by the square root of the discriminant delta. And that square root may or may not be rational. If it's not, then this is going to be a non-trivial extension here. And that delta has the property that if I raise it to the second power, I get an element which belongs again back to the base field, which we can think of as q, but here we're going to think of it as q adjoins zeta 3. So each of these extensions has that in common. And the final extension that we might have to make takes the quantity delta 1 plus the square root of delta over 2, which belongs to that uh, blue field there, and extends by its cube root. And that cube root that we extend by has the property that when we raise it to the third power, we take a step down in our tower. And by the time we get to that top, we have the splitting field for sure of any cubic polynomial. So let's take some stock here. What is it that these extensions have in common? First of all, each of the extensions in our tower is a simple algebraic extension. Every time we just adjoined one new element to uh, the base field. It may or may not actually be new, but definitely it's a simple algebraic extension at each step. The degrees of these extensions are going to be either 2 or 3 or possibly something less. So we could have some extensions here that have a degree of 1. But the total degree has to be less than or equal to 12, just based on the observation of what the degrees of each step have to be. But on the other hand, because we know that the permutations of uh, a splitting field, the automorphisms of a splitting field, permute the roots of the polynomial, and there are only three roots, the Galois group, the automorphism group, has to be a subgroup of S3, and S3 only has six elements in it. And because this is a normal extension, that six-element automorphism group must correspond to a degree six extension. 
So the maximum that this total degree can actually be is 6. And for that reason, one or more of the extensions that we're seeing over here in the tower has to be either trivial or unnecessary. Those are kind of synonyms for the same thing. So we're not actually getting something new at each one of these steps. At most, we can get something new at two out of the three. And finally, the most important property for us about these extensions is that every time we make a simple extension, we're getting an element whose power lands back in the previous field in the tower. So in our first extension, we got a square root, or sorry, a, a cube root going from uh, q to q adjoined zeta 3. In our second step, we got a square root of the discriminant. So that's a, a second power, lands back in the previous field. And then in our last step, we got a cube root. So we got a new element whose third power belongs to the previous step. So there's this recursive relationship between the extensions in our tower that is going to characterize what it means for us to solve a polynomial in radicals. So what we want to do next is extend this to the more general notion of, in general, what does it mean for a polynomial to be solvable by radicals? And more excitingly, how are we going to recognize that phenomenon via a property of the automorphism group of that splitting field?